on dynamics and last but not the least presentation will be given by Dr. Rossi from mm -hmm. Paris. Okay, thank you, thank you, Victor. And uh, so I will talk about um, frequency-dependent acoustic propagation and beam steering in uh, hexagonal lattices by using um, by in the framework of continuum modeling and strain gradient elasticity. I would like also to thank the previous speakers because they did a perfect uh, <laughs> introduction to the things also that, that, I'm, that I'm also presenting. So it's. Uh, it's very convenient and it was very nice to listen to the presentation. Uh, this is a joint work with, uh, with Nicola. So the first slide uh, is, is the same I show uh, since a uh, couple of years, I think. Uh, the objective of this, of these works are uh, to take an existing uh, material and uh, try to replace it, that there is some kind of microstructure features, and to replace it with a continuum model which is able to predict the high frequency behavior. So high frequency can mean other things, but uh, go a little bit further uh, with respect to the classic, to the classic uh, description and capture effect like backscattering, uh, uh, characteristic length, uh, chirality, anisotropy, and directivity, for instance. So it could be uh, biological tissue, metamaterial, or bioinspired material. Uh, the motivation, the main motivations of this talk uh, uh, comes from two uh, principles used in uh, crystallography. The first one is the Norman principle of Curie law that basically says if you see in your microstructure, in your crystal, some kind of invariance with respect to symmetry operation, you should expect to see the same in the physical properties, let's say constitutive relations or uh, let's say constitutive relations. And uh, the Hermann theorem of crystal physics that says that if you want to describe a uh, um, uh, n-fold axis of symmetry, you need a, a, R, uh, a tensor which has the same rank. For describing, for instance, a six-fold symmetry of an hexagonal lattice with respect to, 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 an, to an axis, you need at least a constitutive tensor of order six. That's, uh, I'm talking about this because the talk will be about hexagonal lattices, so I will consider a uh, real structure, let's say, uh, with, uh, with uh, these properties. So the size of the cell, it's one millimeter, and the thickness of the wall is zero, zero, one millimeters, and these uh, constitutive parameters for the bulk, for the material composing the structure, these are voids. This is supposed to be infinite in 2D in plane strain. Uh, so we want to describe the dynamic behavior of this lattice by using a continuum model. So since this is this has clearly a six-fold symmetry, a Cauchy continuum, which has a constitutive tensor, the, the elasticity tensor of order four, <coughs> will not see this kind of, uh, of anisotropy. This is a homogeneous, uh, this is an isotropic uh, material in 2D for, uh, for in, classical, in classical elasticity. Uh, so, uh, well, so I want to. I will start by showing the dispersion diagram of this unit cell. So, uh, thank you to the previous speaker. You already uh, saw the dispersion diagram. This is obtained uh, with a Floquet block analysis uh, on the unit cell. So, I take they took the unit cell. I put. Uh, periodic uh, Floquet uh, conditions, uh, like uh, Claude Boutin showed in, this, uh, in his presentation, and you obtain this complex, very complex picture. Here is, there is the wave number computed in, along this, uh, this zone, so on the border of the red zone here, and here you have the frequency. So the frequency range is from 0 to, this is 1.5 megahertz, so it's not, uh, it's not so high, but you see that if you go uh, here we need uh, to describe this very complex, very complex behavior, and uh, um, so I will need, since I want to use a, an approximated model, to reduce the domain of validity of my model. I cannot, uh, I will not be interested in describing everything. So I will limit myself to this zone. How do I choose this? Uh, because it, this is roughly uh, one third of this segment, maybe more in the, in the plot, but uh, it should be one third. So it is uh, roughly six times, the wavelength in this point is six times the size of the microstructure. 
and uh, so I will limit here and uh, y the two sides because this is representing what's happening in this direction OA and this is what is happening on the other direction so if the material is anisotropic as I claimed uh, it to be we should not see this exactly the same, the same thing uh, so this is what we obtain if we take the zoom and on the right side I just flipped the figure so you see there is not very much difference between what happens when a plane wave propagates in this direction let's say theta equal to 0 or 30 if I superpose the graph you see that there is a slight difference for this curve uh, this branch correspond to, corresponds to shear waves okay? and this corresponds to P waves in a classic continuum you cannot have dispersion so these should be straight lines and you see that for P waves this branch here it's almost straight, it's almost the same, so we, I don't expect in this frequency range to see much differences. And in for S waves, here you have this slight change of behavior. It means that a wave uh, going in, uh, we are playing wave going in direction zero degrees, uh, will have a slightly different phase velocity and group velocity and propagation constants with respect to the other. So here it seems to be uh, very, very small, but we will see that the effects are, are, are there. So what I want to use to fit this curve, uh, with the, what is the continuum model that, I will, uh, that, we, that we used? As I said before, it is a string gradient uh, model, uh, exactly in the framework uh, defined by the long wave approximation in Mindlin uh, 64 uh, paper. Basically, we have a kinetic energy with the classic term and this term that contains a gradient of uh, of the velocity, so it's a micro inertia term, and this is the classic term of elasticity. And here you have the gradient part. Uh, so we saw, we already saw the equation. Almost uh, everyone in this room knows very well. So the, we obtain this uh, this balance equation. The key point is not the balance equations, of course, is the constitutive relations. So this is the framework of the constitutive relations. So here. Uh, you have stresses and uh, impulse. Uh, here you have uh, the, um, the kinematical descriptors. Uh, so this is the velocity and this is the strain, uh, infinitesimal strain. I mean linear elasticity, of course. And this is the gradient of strain. And uh, <coughs> so in this part of the constitutive relation, you have the classic elasticity tensor, the sixth order tensor of uh, second order and eventually this coupling that is there only if you have a non centrosymmetric material uh, for the inertia part you have the, the mass density here that is isotropic this micro inertia tensor that will be considered as well isotropic but in reality it is a fourth order tensor and eventually a coupling a third order tensor for coupling for non centrosymmetric materials in terms uh, so this is the work uh, uh, mainly by uh, Nicola, as you can imagine, and uh, <laughs> this is the number of coefficients you need uh, to describe for each uh, for each class of symmetry uh, the tensors that are here. So I'm not considering the inertia. Okay, so if you start in, in 2D, so in, for isotropic material you have six coefficients, four for the string gradient and two classic uh, Lamé parameters for instance. So if I go to hexagonal that is here, I only need one more coefficient. So this is nice because it's not, I'm not uh, adding, we are not adding complexity uh, for, for considering this kind, this kind of geometry. So it's, it's, it's a good news and moreover we can see that uh, the, if we write uh, the, this constitutive tensor with respect to the material orientation, so this uh, theta will be the orientation of the unit cell, okay, not the direction of the wave propagation. Uh, this can be decomposed. This is also by <laughs> Nicola, but this is my way of writing. He will not be happy, maybe. Uh, this can be decomposed exactly in uh, by, by harmonic decomposition in an isotropic part and uh, a part that is responsible for the anisotropy, that carries alone the anisotropy, it depends only on, the, uh, on one coefficient. Okay, so we can really split 
they constitute the evaporator in two parts. A uh, classic, if you want, I know, uh, isotropic part with four coefficient, and the anisotropy is carried only uh, on, uh, on another part of the tensor with, uh, uh, with, one, with one coefficient. Uh, so the coefficient to be identified in terms of, this is a delicate point, but in terms of bulk wave propagation, not all these coefficients appear. Only a linear combination of them appears. For instance, if wave velocity, you will only see, uh, here I call the, these three coefficients, so AS and AP, this is the higher order coefficient that will appear in uh, shear wave velocity, so the S. This is will appear in longitudinal P wave uh, velocity, and this is the anisotropic coefficient. There's no reason for the D, but it's, it's, it's this one, it's exactly this one. And these are linear combinations of, uh, of the four that are, that are here. So since I'm not, uh, I, I don't, I will not uh, uh, talk about boundary conditions, this, uh, these are the coefficients I will, I will identify. And uh, we also have the microinertia coefficients. There are just two of them because uh, we are considering isotropic microinertia tensor. And uh, I will call it JS for S waves and JP for, for P waves. So once we um, found uh, the correct form for the, for the um, uh, constitutive operator. We perform a plane wave, uh, we use a plane wave solution in the bulk equation to retrieve uh, what we call the uh, generalized acoustic tensor, which is a generalization of the classic acoustic or Christoffel tensor uh, that you can see here. Actually, if you put uh, the frequency to zero, this term vanish, and if it's not a second gradient material, the six order tensor vanish, or if you put the frequency to zero, and you have only C uh, multiplying the uh, with, with the two direction uh, of, of, of propagation, as in the in the classic uh, in the classic Christopher tensor. And uh, why are we doing this? Because this is an, uh, an easy way to uh, retrieve eigenvectors that will give polarization of waves and uh, eigenvalues that will give uh, the, phase, the phase velocity of, this, of these waves. Uh, so with the uh, identification, with the choice of the parameters of the variables, of the constitutive coefficient I performed before, I can show you what happens to the phase velocity. Uh, very quickly, you have this is the phase velocity with respect to the wave number. So if I put the wave number to zero here, I expect to fall back in the classic case. That's that's the case. This is the uh, CP is the is the P wave modulus is lambda plus uh, plus uh, two times mu over rho over the density. And when the when the wave number increases, we have these correction terms that we allow the. Um, dispersion curve to, to, to change and we will use these parameters to fit to fit the curve because if we go in the zero direction or in the 30 direction this expression are not the same this is the velocity phase velocity of the P wave and this is of the S wave and if you see there is the AD coefficient that in the zero direction is on P waves and on the 30 degrees direction is on, on the S waves so that, that's why uh, it is the only, that's because uh, it is the only coefficient we can see a change, a change of direction in the material. The other ones are completely isotropic. Uh, so uh, I performed, we performed a, a fit of the dispersion curves obtained for, uh, from block, block analysis and this, uh, these coefficients are uh, suitable to, for, for, for a good fit. So if you look, uh, uh, I obtained a zero for AP waves for the coefficient which is uh, affecting P waves. This is not very much surprising because we saw almost a straight line in the, in the dispersion relation. So it means that for, with respect to P waves in this frequency range, so this is not an exact um, identification for all frequencies range, frequency ranges. It's only a suitable identification in this frequency and wave number range that I showed you before. And so we only have, actually, I only need with this, uh, with this choice of the parameters, the anisotropic parameter to be different from zero. So basically with respect, what I will show you next, 
uh, with respect to classic elasticity, I only have one more parameter. So the uh, Lamé coefficient, equivalent to Lamé coefficient, the density, one and uh, one parameters, uh, and then of course the two the two micro micro inertia. And uh, for curiosity, the characteristic length that corresponds to this parameter is 0.4 millimeters, which is uh, of the same uh, uh, of the magnitude of the. This is between the size of the size of the walls and the unit in cell. Uh, so this is what I obtain for the polar plot of the phase velocity with this uh, with this uh, identification, and uh, I, I will show you a quarter of this. So uh, no, let me go back. So if you see, uh, there is a circle, and then when I increase the frequency, this symmetry uh, bre breaks, and you see that the hexagon is emerging, okay? This is only the shear waves, because for P waves we don't see anything, we see, we see only circles. And if I look close enough, so the points are block from block, Floke block wave analysis, and the lines are the string gradient material. So you see the fit with respect to phase velocity is very good for with only one, one parameter plus the micro, the micro inertia. So I go from 20 to 19 kilohertz, which is not uh, which is inside the, uh, of course I could go further with the strain gradient, but then it will not be fitting anymore the, the model, okay? Uh, a little bit different results are for group velocity, because as uh, Claude Bouton said before, uh, phase velocity and eigenvalues of the, of the acoustic tensor are one part of the story. Polarization is another part. So what happens here? For low frequency, we have a best, a good fit, fit also for group velocity. When the frequency increases, here it's also good. And then uh, here you have, you have a small gap. Why? Because in the computation of group velocity, polarization is, is, is coming. And if you look to what is the mode that corresponds to this uh, propagation in um, in the block analysis, you see that uh, the unit cell is not just translating uh, like it's doing for a pure P mode, but it starts deformating, interacting with other modes. So uh, we are really here with this value at the limit of validity of, of the model. But you see, if you look only phase velocity, you, you think that you are uh, close enough. So group velocity is is, is, is it's the best quantity to, to, to fit actually. The fit was performed on group velocity, but this, this is the best fit for obtaining a continuum variation because I want, I could fit, we could fit uh, perfectly these points with the green curve, but then uh, these other parts will be affected and I will, uh, we wanted to increase the validity domain without leaving uh, spots, let's say. So what we obtained, this is the graph, uh, the the, main, the, the same simulation that showed, uh, Nicola showed in the, in the lower part. So this is a simulation of a pulse, of a shear wave pulse in the middle of, the, of a 2D lattice. This is for the 2D strain gradient with the identification I showed you before, so with one more parameter. And uh, this is, okay, we, you don't see very much maybe here, but this is quantitative. Um, uh, they go at the same speed and the same amount of energy. This is the, the energy that we are uh, seeing. And the same amount of energy is, is, is propagated, so it's quantitatively it works very well. And you see that uh, energy is going in preferred direction with this like kind of cones. So what we wanted to do, th this was uh, up to now is something that we, uh, we already did, is just identification. We knew that the model would work. Uh, now we want to use the continuum model to do something, to do some optimization of this uh, flow, of this energy flow, for instance, and see, for instance, if we can deviate this without affecting the wave, the wave number. So in order to do so, we need to compute the pointing vector. Uh, so this is the shape of the pointing vector in the case of strain gradient elasticity. So it is a bit different from the classic case. The classic case is uh, sigma uh, multiplied by um, sigma uh, times the velocity, let's say sigma is the stress tensor, so here is more complicated, but to compute this, we use uh, this um, variation of the, of the acoustic tensor, so once, uh, once the A matrix and J matrix are, are known, this is a, a, a simple computation, and this is 
these are the polarization vector this u so uh, of course in the computation of uh, the pointing vector polarization plays plays an important an important role and uh, so once we have this uh, I will then I will plot uh, for a given uh, direction of the material so the ma for a given material orientation I will change in this in this plot here I will change the direction of the wave vector okay so what happens is that as you can see when I change the direction of the wave vector the pointing vector that is in red uh, is drawing circles around Okay, it's not going in the same direction as it is expected. It's, it's going in the same direction only for pure direction of symmetries when you are exactly on a mirror line. And uh, so how we can exploit this? Uh, we thought about keeping the same wave vector and turning the material. Okay, so what happens if I do this? You see that the black vector is going, is staying in the same direction and the pointing vector is Play the drawing circles around. So here I'm changing the material orientation, but uh, it's confined is this uh, like uh, this triangle because we are we are in 2D. Uh, but this is exactly what we can expect uh, of. Uh, this is the ra the range of the uh, steering of our wave if we want to change the direction of the energy flow, because this means that if we have a wave going. On, on, a, on certain direction, just changing the material orientation locally, we can change the direction of the pointing vector. Okay, uh, so that's what we wanted to do. Uh, of course, I can show you what happens at different frequencies. So this is 20 kilohertz. It's almost isotropic. This is moving, but it, it is a circle. So the the range of steering is very small. At 60 kilohertz, is a bit higher. At 90 kilohertz, is higher. So the continuum model, for instance, is needed to compute these values. There are the maximum values of the of the steering of the of the pointing vector, for instance. So once we know this, we of course we take this uh, this case, and let's say we want to go, uh, we want a wave to propagate. Uh, from the point, of, so it will be a plane wave with the wave front orthogonal to this line from the point I coordinate zero to L, following a certain a certain path. We must how, how do how we do this? We change the material orientation. So this is a, a capital theta. Sorry, we change the material orientation so to change the direction of this uh, of this uh, pointing vector inside this cone. So we cannot change. Uh, locally uh, more than I showed you was 30, 13 degrees so we cannot just deviate it uh, by the p over 2 and um, uh, so this uh, this is what what we did uh, just to just to test so this simulation is not very clean but so I will uh, uh, a wave will come from from here and hopefully we'll do we'll do this so I know it will do it and uh, you see that this is deviating, so I have some border effect because this simulation is not very clear, but this is performed on the 2D, uh, this is an harmonic, an harmonic wave, so it's not, it's not a pulse at a given frequency, and uh, what if you see carefully, uh, the wave front is always the same, and the energy that we're seeing is, is flowing in this direction, so if we put... It's going up and not down. Because I change, uh, I change only of 10 degrees. If I if I exceed, then we go on the on the other side. Yeah. Because I change it like uh, like this regularly. This is the profile of the angle in the in the simulation. So it's going slightly on one side and then on the other. And so we can uh, we we put a hole inside, for instance, so you can go past the hole. So it's like. Uh, I mean, it's not really cloaking, but you cannot see the hole, for instance, in the, uh, almost all the energy is going here. See, here you have some, some effect, because my simulation was... Uh, here, this is the second gradient. This is strain gradient uh, simulation. So what we are doing next, because, for instance, is uh, 
I, I cannot do very quickly uh, a, a mesh with honeycomb locally changing the orientation, but this this can be can be done. But it's only to see what you can do if you have a continuum model. I, I use the homogenized model. I, I show you what you can do w with this homogenized model with only a small set of coefficients. So this is a classic, a non-standard effect. If I lower the frequency, the beam is going uh, is is going uh, straight. Okay. And uh, okay, so I'm, uh, I'm finished. So the main results are the feet and the this uh, this uh, steering with uh, by controlling the direction of the pointing vector. What we must do next is to to find a more unique identification of the parameters because here some parameters are not are not defined. Only a linear combination of them, and for this we need boundary conditions or solution of a static problem. We need more equations. So it could be a surface wave. It could be a mode uh, uh, frequency um, harmonic uh, solution of a of a. Of a mode of the structure and, and also the validation of this of this path on a, on a real uh, lattice uh, on simulation on real lattices and also experiments that I didn't I didn't put but we are planning to do experiments okay thank you okay, thank you questions yeah, it's a very practical one but um, if uh, this is a continuum model but you yeah. translate it into a real lattice mm -hmm. Um, how many cells do you need to have a deviation of one cell height of eight? Ah, this is uh, we may need to do the calculation, yeah. But this is uh, uh, this is one almost one meter, and the, the microstructure is one millimeter. So it's uh, with respect to its wavelength. You see the wavelength here is six times the microstructure. So you need to play before before what you're saying. There is the continuum limit of the model. So what's deciding the ratio is most of all the continuum limit of the of the model. But this is only an example. We choose this this uh, probably there are more efficient materials to do this. This is a classic material. Uh, Onicom is the most simple material we we we, we thought about. Questions? Welcome. Can I ask you a few questions regarding your material parameters? At the yeah. very beginning, you had already said something about Young's modulus, which was yeah. 20 GPA for your honeycomb structure. And I was wondering, how was this obtained? Ah, this is uh, no. This is the material I put in the Cauchy model for describing this. Yes, but where does it come from? Ah, the nowhere. It's only 20. So it's, a guess. it's a guess. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's only. And, and then later on, when you have the micro inertia, uh, yeah. the units struck me. You had, I think, kilograms per meters. Ah, uh, per meters. Shouldn't it be kilograms times square meters? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's something wrong with this uh, with this unit. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you're 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 right. Uh, wrong, yeah, yeah. The un the, the value is, uh, is is good. The unit the unit should be okay. should be corrected. I guess I don't remember. Is there a microscopic interpretation why the JP and JS is like that? Is it just a uh, Is uh, the microscopic interpretation is the same given by by Mindlin? If you imagine that your microstructure is composed by squares. Uh, then you obtain this when you uh, calculate. Uh, yeah, it is a micro inertia, so it's. Uh, okay, maybe to understand better, what did you take for the row for the density? <coughs> the uh, geometrically from uh, from the calculation of the surface of the of the model. So it is some average. It is. Uh, it's not the. It's. Ex uh, I mean, it's the size, uh, the area of the of the of the walls, and uh, so the the, uh, the density was obtained uh, geometrically. The micro inertia was obtained uh, with the fitting of the curves. Yeah. So the, the 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 unit should be right, but there's not direct interpretation on it. Thank you. Okay. Question. <coughs> but Mintle also provided a formula for computing this micro inertia for the micro structure. Yes. And uh, uh, not for not for each microstructure. I mean, it, 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 it provided in the you mean in the in the 64 paper, the the, the main paper. Yeah, it, it for cubic microstructure. For any, it just gave an integral over density like distance 
average volume average over the okay. entire system or something like that. For every coefficient, because I, 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 don't, I don't remember this. So maybe I, uh, I think for hexagonal structures, it would at least be, uh, then for symmetry reason, isotropic. Uh, yeah, this is uh, if we, with respect to, in, to inertia. Yeah. yeah, it is isotropic. So it, it is affect differently P waves and S waves, but it is. Uh, it is it's actually here we retrieve the. Uh, it's close. This micro inertia is close to the micro inertia of the beams. Actually, if you think about uh, about uh, uh, Timoshenko beams, uh, it, it, it's close to to this to this value actually. Okay. The comparison to the to the Minkley formula would be. Ah yeah, sure, sure. I did. Uh, yeah, I will do it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, go back to the to the graphic, the blue, the blue graphics. Uh, ah, the the, the final. Equation, equation, uh, yes. This. The last one is uh, the wavelength is uh, still uh, six times larger than the cell. Uh yeah, because it's. Uh, it's from here to here, so it's roughly, yeah. Okay. The wavelength is the, it's, it, it is really the limit value. I, I said six, it could be five and a half, but uh, <laughs> in, this, in this simulation. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it should so be. Uh, even though it's uh, quite long wavelengths, so it's sufficient to it's sufficiently accurate in, in the sense that you have, you still have a like five percent error on group velocity. That it depends on your problem. For this kind of uh, example, I wanted to show you was enough. And then Maybe it's not. This is the motion that you indicate here. What is the? It's the energy. Okay. The total energy. So as the energy. Okay. Yeah. And so this means that the energy goes to the direction that is the faster one. Uh, that is going to, it, it depends on the fact that, uh, yeah, th this is what, what, what is, uh, what is doing. So it's, it's going, not, not, not on the faster one, it's the slowest one actually. Yeah. No more questions. Okay, thank you very much again. Okay.